Je suis, je suis très heureux, évidemment, de, de présenter euh, le prochain conférencier, euh, mon collègue et ami, euh, Dr. Vincenzo Di Marzo. Euh, Vincenzo est, est, est maintenant un membre de notre, euh, de notre faculté, de notre institut euh, à l'UCPQ et à l'INAF, à l'Université Laval. Il a été recruté via une charte très prestigieuse d'excellence au Canada euh, sur l'axe euh, microbiote endocannabinoïdome. Donc, euh, je crois que Vincenzo est extrêmement reconnu pour tous ses travaux euh, sur euh, les endocannabinoïdes en général. Et euh, il s'est dit qu'en ce moment, il est en train de faire le pont entre les activités du microbiote et de l'endocannabinoïdome à Québec et en collaboration avec le CNR, qui est l'institut pour lequel Vincenzo travaille et est toujours euh, directeur en Italie. Donc, ça me fait énormément plaisir d'introduire à Vincenzo. Euh, qui va nous parler évidemment de l'inflammation, mais d'un point de vue euh, autant euh, du microbiote que la, de l'endocannabinoïde. Merci André. Euh, merci beaucoup. Je, je commence pour remercier le comité scientifique euh, de cette magnifique euh, conférence. Euh, je suis très heureux d'être ici en compagnie de, de vous, euh, des de, de collègues qui sont très distingués dans, dans le temps de, de l'inflammation. Euh, je crois que que ce ne soit pas un problème pour vous si je donne ma présentation en anglais. C'est que vous voyez, vous voyez le, mon français n'est pas encore à l'auteur. Euh, je, crois, je crois que je respecterais mieux le, le droit académique si je respectais la langue française d'abord, en ne parlant pas. Euh, Peut-être euh, peut la prochaine fois, si vous m'invitez, euh, je, je, je vais le faire. Je vais essayer de le faire. En, en plus, entre ces deux types-là, je me sens un peu... Oh, c'est mieux si je passe à la main. Merci again, and uh, as you can see from the title of my presentation today, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to give you a general message that is, there is a very system, a very complex system of uh, lipid signals that we now refer to as the endocannabinoid dome, which was discovered starting from studies on the, on the cannabis plant that uh, seems to be playing a, a major role in both types of inflammation, the good inflammation and the bad inflammation. Uh, and, uh, and there is a relationship that is emerging between this endocannabinoidome and the gut microbiome, as, uh, as André mentioned. This is basically the mission of, uh, of my chair in Quebec. Uh, so uh, you all know that the endocannabinoid system was discovered following the same reasoning as the endorphin system. So the mechanism of action of THC, which is the psychotropic principle of, of, uh, of cannabis or marijuana, was identified in the early 60s. And then in the 1990s, two receptors, two G protein cup receptors for this uh, compound uh, were identified, the CB1 and the CB2 receptors. The CB1 is probably the most abundant the GPCR in the brain, and the CB2 receptor is very much expressed in immune cells. And of course, if there are receptors, <coughs> there must be endogenous ligands that activate these receptors. And these were discovered in the early 1990s. Uh, we named them endocannabinoids by analogy with the endorphins. And as you can see from their structure, actually they're quite different from, uh, from THC. Uh, but they're lipophilic compounds and they're derived from arachidonic acid, which, as you know, uh, is the biosynthetic precursors of a plethora of, of, uh, of uh, inflammatory, mostly inflammatory mediators. Uh, the endocannabinoid system at the turn of the century was very simple. So there were two major endogenous ligands of cannabinoid receptors, anandamide and 2 arachidonide glycerol, or 2-AG, uh, which are produced on demand following the uh, hydrolysis of uh, lipid precursors. And, uh, and this happens usually uh, following uh, a perturbation of the cellular homeostasis, uh, which is accompanied by increased uh, elevation of calcium, which stimulates the enzymes that lead to the formation of anandamide and 2-AG. And these two compounds then act locally. They're not hormones, they're local uh, paracrine or autocrine mediators, like many other eicosanoids, activate the receptors to play a pro function. And then they're immediately metabolized following cellular reuptake and hydrolysis by two uh, serine hydrolases, uh, FA and MAD lipase. So, uh, to, cut, to cut a very long story short, what, what is this endocannabinoid system? What, what we know now that this is really uh, the ideal pro-homeostatic uh, system for stress recovery and uh, adaptation. And for stress, I don't mean just cellular stress, but organ stress and organism stress. In fact, uh, when this system is activated, 
in a, in a way that is selective in space and time, uh, the endocrine immune system can uh, produce a series of physiological responses that are necessary to recover from stress. And you see here a, a short list of, this, of these effects that are really uh, necessary to the organism and to the cell to, re to recover from stress. And in particular, via CB1 receptors, at least initially, this system mediates a protective pro-inflammatory action and then uh, a pro-resolving and anti-inflammatory action by CB2 uh, uh, receptors. However, a bit like the immune system, if you wish, this system can get uh, disrupted during pathological conditions. And these conditions include conditions such as uh, the metabolic syndrome, obesity, which are accompanied by systemic uh, infl low-grade inflammation, but also neuroinflammatory disorders, and unresolved uh, peripheral organ inflammation, which then leads to fibrosis. Uh, this is basically due to the fact that the endo the endogenous, uh, this endogenous system loses the selectivity in space and time in its mechanism of action, and becomes overactivated, or its activation is misplaced in time or, or place, and contributes to disease uh, progress and symptoms. And this is why this basically became a bit like the the, 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 the sick grail of, of, uh, of pharmacologists and drug developers because uh, everybody thought, well, we can have new drugs by both activating the system and blocking the system. And in fact, uh, THC and its synthetic analogs have been around for now, now several decades, but as you can see here, they're basically used in a very close niche of, uh, of patients. And uh, the use of the CB1 receptor agonist because of the high concentration of these receptors in the brain is very limited by it's a very narrow uh, therapeutic window because these compounds like THC produce uh, unwanted psychotropic actions. Uh, the same applies if you uh, block these receptors, such as in obesity. Uh, this compound, Remonabant, was on the market in Europe for a couple of years. It was very effective against obesity and the metabolic syndrome, but because the CB1 receptors in the brain are so important to recover from stress, possibly because of this reason, uh, this compound had to be withdrawn because it caused in a, in a subset of the obese population, uh, very strong psychiatric uh, effects such as uh, anxiety and depression. So people thought, well, okay, that, let's target the CB2 receptors, which are not uh, expressed in the brain uh, unless uh, during inflammatory uh, conditions, such as in, in, uh, in microglia, or uh, inhibitor uh, compounds that inhibit the degradation of endocannabinoids, because in this way you could preserve the space and time selectivity of the endocannabinoid system. Uh, there have been problems with these two approaches. As you can see here, many of such compounds have failed so far. There are still efforts, particularly with the mag lipase inhibitors that inter interfere with the biosynthesis of one of the two endocannabinoids. Uh, one of the possible reasons why these inhibitors of degradation of endocannabinoids are not producing the expected results in the clinic is probably because the endocannabinoid system is much more complex than we anticipated. There are many biosynthetic pathways leading to an undermine to a G. There are many redundant and often concurrent uh, degradation pathways for an undermine to a G. So if you block the degradation of the biosynthesis of an undermine, you're going to, what are you going to block? And most importantly, an undermine to a G are being discovered as very promiscuous ligands. They also activate other targets. And uh, even more complicated is the fact that uh, both compounds are accompanied by congeners. And these congeners do not activate the same receptors. They activate other receptors, but they are produced by the same biosynthetic enzymes and degraded by a similar uh, uh, degradation route. So if you block the biosynthesis or degradation of these two compounds, you're going to interfere with many other uh, receptors. And we now estimate that there is more than 200 endocannabinoid-like uh, uh, mediators. They're not endocannabinoids that don't bind necessarily CB1 or CB2 receptors, but they're chemically and biochemically similar to the endocannabinoids, and there is over 20 metabolic enzymes and more than 20 metabolic targets. So it's very difficult to pharmacologically interfere with this system. Uh, I'll, I'll go more into detail to, to tell you that the endocannabinoid home, it's a true home uh, that, that's been discovered, is composed by several families of long-chain fatty acid uh, lipid mediators. Uh, there is the endocannabinoid congeners like polyethylamide, linear ethylamide, and monocyclisols, which share uh, the same biosynthetic or inactivating receptors, and in some cases also some of their other non cannabinoid uh, receptors. Uh, these are the NSI ethanolamides, the monocyclisols, but there is also a plethora of other long chain fatty acid mediators that may share inactivating 
uh, pathways with the with the and with NSR ethanolamides and in some cases also the receptors, for example the primary amides, but also the lipo the, the, the anas anacylated uh, amino acids. Just imagine uh, 20 amino acids and uh, at least 10 long chain fatty acids. How many lipid mediators can generate if they make an amide? And there is also uh, acylated transmitters, and, and these compounds have their own receptors, so it's, it's a very complicated uh, system. Particularly because uh, while activation of bionandamide and 2-GFCB1 receptors is, as I mentioned, uh, produces and contributes to obesity and uh, insulin resistance and increased intestinal permeability, other receptors of this endocannabinoidome do exactly the opposite. And this is true also in inflammation. Uh, activation of CB1 receptors uh, produces inflammation initially beneficially and then uh, quite uh, leading to, to, to fibrosis. But other receptors like the PPARs or CB2 receptors or GPR18 uh, seem to be uh, producing opposing actions. And even, even worse, uh, the 3B1 channel, which is the, the, the receptor for capsaicin, was discovered as a receptor for the hot chili pepper uh, component, can play both uh, pro inflammatory and anti inflammatory uh, roles. So as an example of uh, how uh, there is now uh, studies trying to, to develop drugs to, to combat inflammation and particularly fibrosis from CB1 receptor antagonists, uh, and these studies can be summarized as follows. The, the, the blockade of CB1 receptors in peripheral tissue can counteract inflammation and fibrosis in the liver, uh, particularly following the alcoholic and non-alcoholic uh, steatosis, but also in the kidney, uh, such as in, in models of uh, type 1 or type 2 uh, diabetes induced nephropathies, uh, in the lungs, in idiopathic and uh, models of idiopathic and radiation injury uh, pulmonary, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, and in the heart following experimental uh, myocardial infarction in recent uh, cardio cardiopathy. So there's a hope that using uh, peripherally selective, peripherally um, restricted the CV1 at times, one could, uh, could reduce. Uh, these, these disorders linked to chronic uh, inflammation. Uh, we uh, made uh, quite a few studies in, uh, in, a, in an animal model of the Duchenne muscle dystrophy. Uh, we found that, in fact, if you block CB1 receptors, you, you actually ameliorate quite a lot the, the situation in, uh, in, uh, in, my, in, in my tubes in the skeletal muscles of mice. Uh, you can increase the, the number of regenerated uh, myofibers <coughs> and reduce the number of uh, recently damaged uh, myofibers. And this is actually uh, can be observed after uh, only two weeks of treatment, not only at the beginning of their life, of the, uh, the life of these mice, when, when the disease is not so uh, strong, but also uh, in, in, the late, uh, in, in the late life of these mice with, uh, with a kind of uh, uh, lack of dystrophy, which is the, 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 the model of Duchenne muscle dystrophy. Uh, in fact, uh, what we found uh, after two weeks at the end of the experiment, after, after two weeks of treatment from week 35 to week 37, is that uh, treatment with Rimonabab will not only again produce an amelioration, possibly a pro-differentiation differentiation action in the, in the myotubes, but also a strong reduction of, of uh, inflammatory and fibrosis markers in the muscle as well as in, in, in circulation. And, uh, and therefore, uh, considering that children with Duchenne muscle dystrophy actually suffer a lot, not only because of the disease, but also because they are forced to be treated with steroids since very early years of their life, uh, this could be a, 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 new, a new therapeutic <coughs> for, for this uh, rare disorder. The situation, as I said, of the endocannabinoid dome is quite complicated. Uh, the group of Nicolas Flamand, who participates in, in the chair that I direct in Quebec, actually recently discovered that uh, some uh, uh, endocannabinoid-like molecules, such as the ethanolamide or the glycerol of linoleic acid, which can be increased following a, a linoleic acid diet, uh, uh, rich diet, can actually be processed by both eosinophils and neutrophils. Uh, you see here that the, 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 these, these two cells are quite efficacious at producing uh, these uh, congeners of, uh, of anandamide and 2-AG. Uh, there is a strong preference, in fact, uh, for, for the 15 like oxygenase in, in human eosinophils for omega 3 derived uh, glycerols. And these compounds uh, do have their own uh, activity. They do not bind to cannabinoid receptors. For example, the 13 hydroxy uh, derivatives of olinolenic acid, uh, glycerol, and ethanolamide, they do not activate cannabinoid receptors, but they interact, at least one of them. Uh, with, uh, with the 3D1 channels for capsaicin and also with the, with the bars. Uh, 
And this is interesting because it gives me the opportunity to pass on the microbiome part of our work because uh, recently there have been uh, uh, findings in, uh, in uh, uh, gap lactic acid uh, producing bacteria and uh, metabolizing bacteria uh, that a similar compound derived again from linolenic acid can uh, activate 3B1 channels like other compounds and enhance energy metabolism and energy expenditures in mice. And in fact, uh, there was a paper uh, a couple of years ago showing that many conventional bacteria can produce endocannabinoid-like molecules. You see here the molecules that are produced by some bacteria, uh, is widely distributed in, in various uh, phyla, and the, uh, the endogenous counterparts in the host. And the interesting thing is that the bacterial uh, endocannabinoid-like compounds of fatty acid derived mediators, if you wish, can activate the same receptors as the endogenous. Uh, compounds. And this creates the possibility of a very important crosstalk between the host and, and bacteria. In fact, we owe it, I think, to Patrice Cani and this group. The first, uh, one of the first evidences that the endocannabinoidome and the, micro, the gut microbiome are connected, as uh, the group of Patrice showed that in uh, conditions of intestinal dysbiosis induced by high fat diets, uh, you can actually see, of course, the, 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 the leaky gut and the uh, systemic inflammation due to low-grade uh, inflammation due to LPS uh, producing bacteria, but also this is accompanied not only by the well-known consequences on several organs in terms of inflammation and, and, uh, and obesity, but also to a reduction of endocannabinoid dome mediators which play a beneficial role, such as those that activate 3P1 channels, uh, GPR119 and other receptors and an increase of anandamide, which instead activates CB1 receptors and uh, contributes to chronic inflammation. And interestingly, when these mice are given pre or probiotics, you can at the same time reverse the, uh, the dysbiosis and its effects, but also the, the changes in, in these endocannabinoid uh, mediators. So uh, this, this data fit quite well with pharmacological data showing that if you block the CB1 uh, receptors for, endocannabinoid, uh, for endo, uh, endocannabinoids, you do not only block diet induced obesity, but you also attenuate the inflammation and the dysbiosis that is accompanied by, by this condition, particularly increasing the, the, the beloved bacteria by Patrice uh, Ackermann's and Lucinifila. Uh, and likewise, if you give mice fed with a high fat diet, a capsaicin, which as I mentioned is the, uh, uh, the, the, the plant activator of the triple one channels, which are, which are also activated by endogenous and acylethylonamides you see a similar decrease in inflammation and uh, an increase in the gut bacterium, uh, in the gut uh, com composition of Acumatia mucinifida. So a question that, a very simple question that we wanted to address was what happens to the endocannabinoid dome in the gut when we when basically we take away the gut microbiome in, in germ-free mice? So we analyzed the cellular tissues from uh, both male and female germ-free mice at two different ages, four months, uh, four weeks and, and uh, 13 weeks, uh, either without or following uh, one week, uh, one day following a fecal transplantation, matter transplantation for one day, a single one, and then uh, waiting for one week after this transplantation. So we were quite surprised to see very profound changes in many receptors of the endocannabinoid dome which are involved in inflammation. For example, uh, GPR55 was strongly reduced and see how the fecal matter transplant, but not the sham transplant, completely reverses these changes in the duodenum. And uh, at the same time, PPAR alpha, which is a, an anti inflammatory receptor, is increased and this again is, is, an, is uh, reversed by fecal matter transplantation in a specific way. This is very interesting because these mice have uh, much lower inflammation, even though this is accompanied by a compromised immune system in the gut. And likewise, we, we found changes in uh, GPR55 in the opposite direction. In, uh, in the colon, but also changes in CD1, GPR18, and PPAR alpha in other uh, parts of the uh, small and large uh, intestine. And most of these changes were uh, nicely reversed by fecal matter transplant, but not by sham transplant. Interestingly, uh, Patrice also found uh, similar things using a, a different strain of, of, ma of mice. Again, you see how they are uh, the GPR55, which is a, considered a pro inflammatory endocannabinoid dome receptor, is reduced, particularly in the immune, and this is reversed by fecal matter transplant. And perhaps even more interestingly, mice treated uh, with antibiotics again show the same reduction in GPR55 in the immune. So 
This basically established a very strong relationship between the, the, the commensal bacteria and the tone, the, the activity of the endocannabinoid uh, in the gut. And the consequences of this, of course, uh, need to be investigated. But this could, could contribute to the phenotype, the typical phenotype of these germ mice. Other endocannabinoid genes are also changed in, in, uh, in, the, in the gut of, uh, of germ mice. Very rapidly, you see here a typical principal component analysis of all the genes we measured. We have a, a coup PCR array to measure 50 genes for receptors and enzymes in the endocannabinoid. It's a very complicated system. As I mentioned, you see how, particularly in the small intestine, the, condition, the conventionally raised mice and the transplanted mice have clustered together or very close to each other. Uh, and the germ free mice and the sham uh, mice clustered together. Uh, this is true particularly in the small intestine. And also some of the mediators, the endocannabinoid mediators, like the NSI ethanolamides, which activate receptors that are uh, against uh, inflammation or in favor of insulin uh, sensitivity, uh, were increased by the, the, the lack of the, of, the, of the gut microbiota, and this was reversed by fecal matter transplant, particularly in the duodenum. These are two very interesting uh, omega-3 derived uh, N-acyl ethanolamides which have been suggested to play important uh, anti-inflammatory actions to uh, a variety of, of receptors. Uh, then we wonder what if we do the opposite? Uh, instead of taking away the, the microbiota and see what happens to the endocannabinoid, let's take away the endocannabinoid, at least part of it, and see what happens to the microbiota. And we basically use uh, the fact that there are available several knockout mice for the enzymes of the endocannabinoid, such as the monocyte glycerol. So uh, the, the situation is complicated because, of course, as I mentioned before, there is a lot of redundancy and promiscuity in, in, in the degradation of the endocannabinoid. So if you, uh, if you block this and if you take away this enzyme, you're not only affecting the degradation of 2AG, but also those of other monocyte glycerols, which have different receptors. Uh, importantly, the monocyte glycerol lipase is an alternative pathway for a cosanoid and prostanoid pr uh, production in many tissues, including the brain. So you actually block this and you also have a, a blockade of prostanoids. You, you don't know whether the effects you're seeing are due to the elevation of 2AG and the other monocyte glycerols or the reduction of prostanoids. And finally, if you block the enzyme, you trigger other degradation pathways for 2AG. 2AG is a very good substrate, even better than arachidonic acid for COX-2, and produces, as shown also here in, in Brussels by the, the, the group of uh, uh, Giulio Muccioli, produces compounds that can be both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. And uh, uh, the, the phenotype of this mud like this uh, mice is very interesting in terms of inflammation. They are resistant to high fat diet induced insulin resistance and uh, 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 lipolysis, possibly via desensitization of CB1 receptors or activation of GPY119, which is a receptor for other monocyte lizards. They are resistant to uh, atherosclerosis induced by high fat diet in equinocal mice, possibly via CB2 receptor activation. But uh, they are resistant also to other things like uh, hepatic injury or uh, fever, because uh, this enzyme, as I mentioned, is very important in the production of prostanol. So if you if you block it, you, you, you take away some of the prostanols. So what happens to the gut microbiota of these mice? You see here that actually the gut microbiota in terms of, in terms of PCA of the white type of <coughs> knockouts are quite different. And this difference is actually increased uh, when you give uh, uh, for 8 or uh, 22 weeks a high fat diet to these mice. And in particular, you, we see that some of the uh, typical uh, families like uh, lactobacillus, which increase uh, in obesity, do not increase in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the knockout mice. And uh, this is true also for some genera. We only did 16S, so we didn't go in, in, in this case down to the species level. Lactobacillus goes up in the wild type, but not in the knockouts. Very interesting, Midoria uh, uh, um, genera goes up, but again in the wild type, but not in the knockout mice. And this is a species which has been associated both to chronic THC and uh, among uh, and and uh, chronic THC use, but also uh, it's a pro it's supposed to be a pro-inflammatory genera uh, associated with obesity and inflammatory condition. Uh, other species which decrease in wild type mice following the hyper diet do not increase uh, in uh, in uh, in the in the in the, in the knockouts. Uh, uh, this is Clostridium 14a, which is, has been suggested to be beneficial and anti-inflammatory due to. Uh, production of short-chain fatty acids. 
Uh, last one minute, <laughs> just to go back to the cannabis plant. Everybody expects from me to speak about the cannabis plant, even though I don't like it very much. So when I do, I want to stress that the cannabis plant does not contain only THC, but it contains a plethora of compounds, a phytocannabinoidome, if you wish. Uh, just show you the chemical structure of some of them. This is THC, you see some of the others, which are quite, ab are quite abundant. There is a lot of talk these days about cannabidiol, which is now an approved drug against uh, epilepsy in children. Uh, there is their uh, carboxy derivatives, which are the actual compounds found in the plant. There is uh, uh, propyl derivatives, there is methyl derivatives, there is carboxy derivatives. There is more than 140 cannabinoids, but everybody speaks only about THC. And uh, like THC, these compounds interact uh, with, not with the endocannabinoid system, but with the, endo, with the expanded endocannabinoid system. You see a, a summary how many of these compounds I showed before interact with the PARs, with some of the other targets, with some of the enzymes of the endocannabinoid. So to conclude, uh, I hope I didn't go too fast. <laughs> uh, there is an expanded endocannabinoid system for, for simplicity. We, we like it, and we call it endocannabinoidome, but at the end of, uh, during the coffee break, I'll challenge each of you to say this word. It's rapidly emerging. Uh, there are different uh, ECBOM or endocannabinoidome <coughs> targets that play different roles in inflammation. Uh, CB1 receptors are usually uh, involved in chronic inflammation and fibrosis, and this can lead to the development of CB1 receptor antagonists, particularly per peripherally restricted and CB1 antagonists with no effect on the brain. Uh, there is possibly hundreds of uh, uh, these lipid mediators. We don't know the, uh, the, 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 the role in inflammation for most of them. There is a bilateral communication between this endocannabinoid and gut microbiota, which is probably very important for, for uh, the immune response and inflammatory response. And there are many of them, non THC uh, plant cannabinoids, that may act via the endocannabinoid, but also via different, completely different molecular targets. It affects, it, they affect the inflammatory response even better than THC and the gut microbiota uh, as well. And uh, let me thank the people of uh, my uh, old group. Je voudrais remercier les gens de mon vieux groupe et aussi Professor Itzo avec whom we did les études sur l'inflammation. Et mon nouveau groupe, comme vous voyez, il y a les, les conditions météo <rire> qui sont vraiment différentes entre les, les deux places, là, Naples et, et, et Québec. Mais je dois dire que je l'aime beaucoup, tous les deux. Merci. Merci, merci beaucoup, Vincenzo, de nous avoir entretenu sur l'endocannabinoïde. Euh, Emile me dit qu'on a le temps pour quelques questions, deux, trois minutes. Donc, est-ce qu'il y a des questions dans la salle pour Vincenzo qui peut bien sûr répondre autant en français qu'en anglais? Oui, oui, oui. Ah, <rire> Moi, je vais répondre en anglais pour une question de temps. Pour sauver de, pour nous sauver de temps. Hi. I'm Francesco with TechPlus so to do any English as well. Okay. Uh, in your non-quite minds, did you check some inflammatory markers? Because since you were talking that endocannabinoid endocannabin system yeah. are involved in, in inflammation, did you check some inflammatory markers in several organs or to the process it is done later or not? We didn't do it, but uh, the people who published this the study on atherosclerosis did, and in fact, uh, they actually checked on, uh, on inflammatory markers on the plaque and in the blood on the aorta plaques and in the blood, and they found that they have less. Uh, but most importantly, those mice actually have a, a more stable plaque, so it's not ju just a matter of inflammation, but also uh, stability of, uh, of, of the plaques. Of course, home cells, macrophages are, are involved in that. So we didn't do that in our study, uh, because it was a global knockout mice, so we didn't really expect to see uh, huge changes in the blood. But uh, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for this beautiful presentation and uh, for all the work you have done in the past and you are still doing, and that's a very, very fascinating uh, topic. I was wondering if, in a nutritional point of view, you have published several data on the fish oils and omega-3, uh, and, and I was wondering if the, the omega-3 derivatives were finally acting through the endocannabinoid system, or do you think that the GPL120 is finally the, the major actor in the anti-inflammatory part, but also in the protection against different uh, yeah, that's a very nice question, Patrice. Uh, 
both. I think if you, it's a matter of uh, uh, when you give these dietary components, you're actually affecting the phospholipid composition of, in fatty acids. Uh, you do that mostly in periphery, not so much in the brain, but this happens also in the brain. That means that you increase the, the, the percent amount of omega 3s in phospholipids and you necessarily decrease that of others, especially uh, the arachidonic acid drug. So, yes, there is a decrease with the dietary omega 3s, especially in the form of the krill oil more than fish oil, uh, which could be good for inflammation because that leads to the decrease of CD1 receptors. There is a corresponding increase in the omega-3 derived uh, ethanolamides and glycerol esters, and these, as you say, have their own receptors. Also, GPI-110 has been shown to be a receptor for the uh, DHA derived uh, ethanolamide. Uh, but I must say that this is very true in uh, in uh, in mice. It's also true for the blood of uh, human beings with obesity, but we don't have the same results in many other tissues in biopsies. Uh, so it, it may apply mostly to animal models, not so much in, to humans, even though we do see big changes in the blood of these uh, patients following fish oil and krill oil, particularly krill oil. Dernier question, it's another one. Thank you very much, I learned a lot, I must say. Uh, you, you focus a lot on the link between your regulation and inflammation focusing on the PG2 to simplify pathway. But as you know, the, it's a long sequence of events when you start with LPS, TLA4, L1, and others, and PG2. So the regulation you describe as a PG2 level applies copy and paste, or do you have uh, a different types of type of regulation for each of these levels? Okay, so uh, it, it, it's a complicated story. What people have found, and we have confirmed that, is that COPS2 not, not COX-1, but COX-2, can actually recognize the endocannabinoids and some of the other arachidonic acid-derived endocannabinoid-like molecules. And this leads to compounds that have receptors that are not prostanoid receptors and are not prostaglandin receptors. So this is one way of interacting. The other way of interacting is when you block the enzyme that degrades 2-AG, because in some tissues, including the brain, that enzyme, the 2-AG, behaves as a precursor for arachidonic acid. So it's a, uh, an alternative pathway to phospholipase A2-derived arachidonic acid. So in that case, uh, researchers in the United States have shown that if you block mag lipase, you have an anti-inflammatory reaction, which is not due to indirect activation of CB1, uh, indirect uh, um, blockage of CB1, indirect activation of CB2 receptors, but it's due to the lack of prostanoids in, in the brain. So they've done lipidomic studies in mild lipase, not that much, showing that most of these prostanoids are reduced in the brain, uh, possibly also in the liver. So this could explain some, uh, some, uh, some effects on fibrosis. And, and finally, of course, there could be different interactions uh, because, as you know, there are many compounds that regulate the expression of COX-2, it's an inducible enzyme. So there is also evidence that some of these endocannabinoid mediators could also regulate the expression of COX-2. Merci, Vincenzo. Je vous encourage à continuer à poser des questions à Vincenzo pendant la pause café, que nous allons mettre en voir jusqu'à 10h45. Donc, on va retourner à 10h45, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup, Vincenzo, encore.